Jednom dobrodošli na prvu Agile konferenciju u Srbiji. Pre svega želimo da vam se zahvalimo na velikom interesovanju i na tome što ste došli u ovolikom broju, a mi se nadamo da ćemo to veliko interesovanje opravdati i sjajnim predavanjima, zatim interaktivnim diskusijama i radionicama koje smo pripremili za vas. Na početku ja ću se potruditi da pridobijem vašu pažnju, što neće biti baš lako s obzirom da je devet ujutru, a svi znamo kako funkcioniše vaš IT svet u devet ujutru ili ne funkcioniše. Moj najbolji prijatelj, inače IT stručnjak, i on se uvek hvali kako tek u deset ujutru radi svoju jutarnju jogu na poslu. Da se predstavi moje ime, Nena Stefanovski, dolazim iz organizacije Stand Up RS, inače sam iz Makedonije, što nam je jedno pitanje, je moguće je tolika kriza kod vas da morate baš komičar iz Makedonije da dovodite, da vodi cijelo ovo dešavanje. Moj prijatelj, inače Nikola Silić iz organizacije treba da vodi, da bude na ovom mestu danas, Međutim, ispostavilo se da sam ja, ja sam bio jeftinija varijanta, drugi izbor, što bi vi rekli, ja se sad osjećam kao Windows. Dolazim iz Skoplja, to je grad, što ga mnogi zovu sada, muzej voštenih figura. To je ljudi spomenik do spomenika u celom Skoplju. Imamo biste spomenika, da ne verujete koliko imamo. Neki su tu iz opravdanih razloga, neki baš i nisu. Imamo, recimo, s obzirom da smo najškrtija nacija na svetu, a to vam lično garantujem, imamo izgrađenu triumfalnu kapiju u Skoplju da ne bi putovali do Pariza. Znači, opravdano. Imamo i bistu golog Prometeja. Nemamo pojma zašto je Prometej svuda u svetu go. Naša bista je gola iz čisto ekonomski opravdanih razloga. Još jednom opravdano. Imamo i bistu Aleksandra Makedonskog. Ne znate kolika je to bista. Ljudi, ono može se vidi s meseca, mada za to nas boli, ovo nama je bitno da ga vide Grci. Tako da, još jednom opravdano. Tako je, opustite se ljudi, smejte se. Puno je Skoplje nekih biste i spomenike. Bio neko možda u posljednje dve, tri godine u Skoplju? Bio neko, vi? Jeste vidjeli? Ko je budale, a? Da ne verujete. A šta vas briga, 30 evra povratna karta, vidite i Skoplje i Pariz. Molim, lepo. Sad pravimo onaj panoramski točak, dođite dogodim da vidite i London. Molim, lepo. Cena i dare 30 evra, ništa se ne menja. Molim, lepo. Ja sam inače odrastao ovde u Beogradu, živim ovde od svoje 13. godine, ali sam ostao pravo, ono makedonsko dete, škrto sa svim vrednostima, dobro zarađujem ovde, ništa ne trošim, ponos porodice. Da nisam bio taka sramota za porodicu, ljudi. Što da kaže moja majka kad dođe u Makedoniju, kad recimo tetka da je pita kako ti je dete? Ah, užas. Jel pije? Ne. Jel se drogira? Jao, još gore. Jel programer? Nije, kamo sreće da je to. A manže, jedno šta je dete tom govori? On volontira. Ali ne volontiram, male su plate. A tako vam je to na jugu, to što kažete vi, što južnije, to tužnije. Mi kažemo, mi južnije kupujemo samo najnužnije. Molim, lepo. Imamo nekog s juga možda ovde danas, Sniš, Pirot, Franje, ne doj Bože, Skoplje. Imamo, pa naravno, posle ima i kafa, i ručak, i cold cut party. Što da ne. Hvala. A volim ovde život u Beogradu, uvijek se živi nekako na marginama zakona, niko ne očitava kartice u busu, u autobusu je atmosfera kao u western filmu, svima su prsti na kartici, svi su ovde u ovom fazonu nekom. Kad dođete na trafiku, ono, može dopuno za bus plus. Za koliko? Za ne daj Bože. Znači za sto, za sto. Pa kad uđe kontrola u autobusu, pa krene odmah obračun, samo se čuje bi, 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 bi. Ako nemate municiju, ona ostave vas na stup srama, čoveče. Ona žena se nikad čuje, ne čuje lepo na aparati. Moje kasnije jedan za drugim, onako sledeći, 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 stajalište, stajalište, stajalište. A kad nemate dovoljno na kartici, nemate dovoljno kredita. Tu ste vi, programeri, sto posto uradili to. Ajde da napravimo za ove sirotinje iz GSP, da napravimo aplikacije. Ajde minijona da stavimo koji će duperi prstom na njih, onako, ovaj nema kredita. Kao, ne, ne, neka bude samo dovoljno glasno da se prodere, onako, on nema dovoljno kredita da ga svi lepo pogledaju, da se stidi, onako. Jeste primetili, to ste vi isto verovatno radili. Kad uđe kontrola, čuje se bi, bi, bi. Ponekad se čuje e do mojega. Šta da vam kažem, bit će danas lepih predavanja, Ja sam, što se tiče tih predavanja, ja sam nedavno u autobusu prisustuo o razgovoru s Srbini i Makedonci, sad Srbi njemu nešto priča, 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 Makedonac je u fozonu, da, 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 jeste, jeste, Srbi njemu nešto priča, 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 Makedonac je u fozonu, da, 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 jeste, krene Makedonac njemu nešto da priča, 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 a Srbini je u fozonu, brate, ja tebe ništa ne razumim. 
Ja tebe ništa ne razumem. Meni sad nije jasno kako mi vas sa sedam padeža sve razumemo, vi nas sa dvama baš ništa. Naučite jednu reč, ništa ne menjate. Mi pričamo duše malo brže, svaka druga reč se završava na ta, pa kapiram da sve što čujete samo to ta, 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 ta. Zato i nemamo valja drti talking u krevetu, iš kada ga majstor ubaci u drugu, pa ta, 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 pa užas, jedan. Ako nešto, predavanja su danas na srpskom, engleskom, hvala Bogu nisu na makedonskom, tražili biste vratno pare nazad. Ali ako nešto ne razumete, vi samo ko Hrvati, ko vaše komšije, vi ćete ne, ne, ne. Ili ima možda nekog da je iz Hrvatske, da je rodom iz Hrvatske ili tako nešto? Evo ga, jedan. Evo, jel da, vi imate sjajnu uzrečicu na kraju, uvijek kažete ne. O, kak vam je lipo ovdje u Beogradu, ne? Što to rade? Znaš, kao da pokušavaju da nas zeznu, kao da pričaš s jednom osobom koja hoće nešto ti kaže, njena druga ličnost pokušava da je opovrgna. I si ti iz Beograda, ali da, ne? Skoro mi jedna zagrebčanka kaže, a, čula sam da imate dobre komičare ovdje u Beogradu, ne? A, rekao, zezao, mene, sto posto. Evo ovako, sva predavanja su, dakle, sjajno pripremljena, nešto kasnije će vam gospodin Marko Branković o tome opširnije reći. Ja samo želim da se zahvalim današnjim sponzorima, bez kojih danas ništa ne bi bilo odavde moguće, koji su potpomogli čitav ovaj događaj i ovako krenut ću redom, pre svega Scrum Alliance, koji je najveći i najuticalnije profesionalno udruženje za izdavanje sertifikata u Agile zajednici. Do sada su izdali preko 450.000 sertifikata širom sveta. Njihova vizija je da transformiše svet poslovanja sa misijom da potpomaže i inspiriše pojedince, organizacije i lidere. Zatim to rade putem različitih praksi, principa i vrednosti koje kreiraju radna mesta, koje su pritom prosperitetivna, vesela i održiva. Zahvaljujući njihovoj podržici, učesnici današnje konferencije, koji su pritom članovi Scrum Alliance-a, imaju priliku da apliciraju za dodatne SEU poene ka Certified Scrum Professional organizaciji, a zatim i Humanity, koja je zlatni sponsor današnje konferencije. Humanity je kompanija koja za misiju ima modernizaciju radnih mesta i okruženja, konstantno ulažeći u razvoj svojih zaposlenih. Većina njihovih zaposlenih je bila već učesnik Certified Scrum Master i Scrum Product Owner kurseva, kao i Advanced Scrum Agile treninga u Srbiji. Također, u domenu svoje delatnosti, mnoge organizacije, udruženja i kompanije su pružili podršku današnjoj konferenciji, prepoznajući značaj ovog događaja za srpsku IT i biznis zajednicu. Kao što sam pomenuo, na početku ću dati uvodnu reč gospodinu Marku Brankoviću, koji je direktor i osnivač Puzzle Softvera, koji je ujedno i organizator današnje Agile Serbije konferencije. Pa bih ja zamolio da jednim aplauzom pozdravite gospodina Marka Brankovića. Mikrofonija. Dobro jutro svima. Kao što Nenad reče, ja sam Marko Branković iz Puzzle Softvera. Hteo bih da se zahvalim prvo što ste došli u ovolikom broju, a posebno bih hteo da se zahvalim našim pazlicama, našim devojkama iz Puzzle Softvera, zbog kojih ove konferencije ne bi bila uopšte moguća. Za jako kratko vreme su organizovale sve, pozvali sve vas i sredile da ova konferencija ovako izgleda kako sad izgleda. Zahvalio bi se Jeleni Branković, Jeleni Bogdanić, Aleksandri Kebić i Marini Bušić. Pošto već klizamo sa vremenom, ja sam vam... Aplauz, da. Puzzle Software postoji od 2009. godine i mogu reći da mi od prvog dana praktikujemo Scrum i Agile. Isto tako mogu reći da smo imali nekoliko uspešnih projekata jedan koji je trajao i duže od godinu dana, ali u početku nije to išlo baš tako lako. Nismo bili iskusni u tome, kako da kažem, padali smo sprintove zbog toga što nismo znali da uradimo dobro procenu vremena, to je story pointa, imali smo raznih problema koji su uticali na to da imamo poteškoće sa uvođenjem skrama, Međutim, imali smo dobru podršku i Scrum Alijanse, nekoliko dobrih kouča i adaptacijom i inspekcijom celog procesa došli smo do toga da prosto posle određenog vremena možemo da završavamo sprintove na vreme, da imamo otvoren i potpuno otvoren odnos sa klijentom, da nas klijenti prihvate i da nam daju svoje biznis danje da bi mi mogli to da pretočimo u dobar kod. 
Danas, 2011. godine, krenuli smo sa prvim Scrum Master kursom, pošto se ja nošim mišlju da ne treba propovedati ono u šta ne veruješ. Tako da, mi smo prvo dve godine pokušali na sebi da primemimo Scrum i kada smo uspeli, onda smo shvatili da bi to trebali da podelimo sa ostatkom Srbije. Ja sam u početku išao od firme do firme, pošto se tada nije znalo za Scrum, kao, kako da kažem, Kirby prodavac od firme do firme i držao introduction to Scrum. I mogu reći da su firme jako brzo prihvatile, pogotovo u softverske firme, da su jako brzo prihvatile ceo Agile i počele da šalju ljude od 2011. godine na kurseve. Do, evo, 2016. godine napravili smo pet godina kurseva gde imamo preko 400 sertifikovanih Scrum Mastera i Product Ownera, što je, ajde da kažem, veliki broj. I jako sam srećen da se posle pet godina ovoliko ljudi u Srbiji interesuje za Agile razvoj softvera. Tako da, eto, to je to. Ja bih samo iskoristio par minuta da prođemo kroz program i kako smo u stvari zamislili ovaj program. Tema ovogodišnje konferencije, glavna tema ovogodišnje konferencije je Agile and Startups. Zašto Startups? Ove godine će biti Agile and Startups, sledeće godine će biti Agile and Developers, pa ćemo smisliti nešto treće. Nadam se da će ova konferencija trajati dugo godine i da ćemo imati vaše interesovanje. Startups zbog toga što mislimo da startup ne može da preživi ako nije agilan. Agilan znači da treba da se vrlo brzo odgovori na sve promene koje se dešavaju. Da li je to u okruženju, da li je to u okviru firme i tako dalje. U tom maniru imamo dva predavanja danas što se tiče startupa. Jedno će biti od Baneta Vujovića, predsednika New Frontier grupe. On će predstaviti New Frontier grupu, svoj investicijoni fond i ispričat će jednu jako zanimljivu priču što se tiče startupa i digitalne revolucije. Sa druge strane imat ćemo isto jako zanimljivo predavanje Dry Toolsa i SC Venturesa gde ćemo u paru videti Vuka Đukića i Vuk Đukić i za Marko Gačeša, tako je, izvinjavam se gde će Marko Gačeša pričati sa strane Dry Toolsa, to je startupa koji je dobio 300.000 evra, a Vuk Đukić će pričati sa strane investicijonog fonda koji je dao 300.000 evra i dokle su sada stigli. Što se tiče samog Scrama i Agile-a, imat ćemo jako zanimljive teme i pokrit ćemo Agile sa nekoliko aspekata. Organization Culture pokrit će Jurgen Apelo, vrlo zanimljiva tema. Zoran Vujkov će pokriti tehnički deo Agile-a, to jest koje su to dobre prakse koje se koriste u Agile-u, a nisu deo Scrama, ali poboljšavaju produktivnost Scrum timova. Ren Neumann će pričati o Large Scale Scrum-u. To je, ajde kažem, nova metodologija koja se prilično skoro pojavila, možda pre dve godine napravljena od strane Craig Larmana i prihvaćena od strane Scrum Alijanse. Vrlo zanimljiva tema. Petri Herijamo će sagledati i pričati o tome kako napraviti dobar Scrum team, pravi Scrum team koji stvarno sinergetski daje mnogo bolje rezultate. I ono što mislimo da je jako bitno i što mislimo da nedostaje u dosta firmi ovde u Srbiji je ugrađivanje kvaliteta od samog početka. Nekako zbog pritiska da se izbaciš sve više i više i više i više funkcionalnosti, uvek nekako testiranje trpi. Uvek nekako zaobiđemo to testiranje i dođemo do toga da izbacujemo softver sa previše bagova i gubimo na kraju poverenje klijenta. Mi smo poseban deo današnje konferencije, a i poslednje predavanje će biti Maret i Levelin, koji će pričati o odnosu testara i development na velikoj sceni, a imat ćemo i dva workshopa koje će trajati po sat i po vremena u maloj sali, gde će pričati o tome o TDD-u i pričat će o exploratory testingu. Vrlo zanimljive teme, broj mesta je ograničen u maloj sali, u stvari najmanjoj sali, u workshop sali, koja prima negde od 30 do 40 ljudi. A što se tiče interactive discussion scene, koja je bila ideja? Meni je uvek smetalo kada sam išao na konferenciji i kada neki ekspert izađe i ispriča nešto što je u njegovoj oblasti, 
obično ima nekih pet do deset minuta za neka pitanja i to nikada nije dovoljno i ja želim da saznam više od tog čoveka. Mi smo danas napravili, ajde da kažem, jedan eksperiment gde će predavači imati 45 minuta ovde slot da ispričaju šta imaju da ispričaju, a onda će da pređu posle tog predavanja u malu salu koja bi trebala primiti do 160 ljudi, na interaktivnu diskusiju. Znači, imamo 45 minuta posle toga da pričate sa njima šta god vas interesuje. Totalno je drugačija atmosfera nego ovde. To je to što se tiče predavanja. Nadam se da će vam biti ok. Mi smo inače softerska firma, isto kao i vi, ne bavimo se konferencijama, tako da ako se slučajno desi neki propust sa naše strane, prva nam je konferencija i nemojte nam zameriti. Eto, toliko od mene. Pozvao bi Nenada da najavi keynote speakera, pa se vidimo na predavanjima. Thank you, and once again here we have Mr. Marko Branković. Please, one applause for him. The next person to take the stage is one of the biggest name in the European agile world, and the theme of the first lecture is Be the change you wish to see. I know that the change I wish to see is in my girlfriend. Namely, she is not a developer, but she acts like one. Actually, more like a QA. I heard that you guys hate each other, am I right? So, the moment when you think that everything is perfect, that everything is, is working just fine, there she comes, my QA girl. She conv she'll convince you that there are at least 15 errors that needs to be corrected, and of course, she will try to correct them in the most complicated way that subsequently you will never understand. So, uh, we are very pleased to have Mr. Apello here tonight, today, to discuss what else needs to be done so you can be the change you wish to see. So, please give him a warm welcome as he comes to the stage, Mr. Jurgen Apello. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some wonderful introductions. It's awesome to be here. This is the first Agile Serbia conference, and you, they will never take that away from you, right? You are there at the first Agile Serbia conference ever. You will tell your grandchildren in the future. <laughs> I was there. You were not. <laughs> so I can, I'm going to tell my grandchildren. And uh, I already learned something very, very important today. I learned that these in Serbia are called Madonna microphones. <laughs> I love it. Holiday! <laughs> so cool. From now on, these will be Madonna microphones for me, I will tell everyone around the world. So, um, all right, let's get started. First, um, let's see, is this, going, is this working? This is not working. Okay, we have a problem. Clicker is not working. It's working. Yeah, now it's working. Thank you. <laughs> so, before we start, um, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up, please. Everyone, stand up. Yeah, stand up. It's early morning, I know, Saturday, you haven't slept well, you had party yesterday night, I know that. Stretch your legs a bit. All right. I'm going to ask you three questions, three difficult questions, and I want you to be very, very honest with me. Just pretend that I am your mother-in-law. Right? <laughs> I just found out that you flushed my homemade lemonade down the toilet. Right? I know that. I saw it. So be honest. So, first question. Many organizations around the world struggle with innovation. Uh, if you recognize that with your company, please take a seat. If you recognize that your organization has difficulty launching new products, new services, please take a seat. That was question one. All right. I hope that not everyone's going to sit down. Okay, we have some remaining. That's good. That's good. <laughs> the second one. Second question. Many people find it difficult to introduce change in the organization. If you recognize that in yourself, please sit down. If you find it difficult to convince your team members and others in the company to for new ideas, new practices, please take a seat. All right. Oh, Ooh, this is exciting. We have about eight people left, nine people. <laughs> 
Last question. Third question. Research confirms again and again that many people in the world are not fully happy in their jobs. If you recognize that, please take a seat. <laughs> if you're not fully engaged and satisfied with your work, please take a seat. So, that is so, we have three people remaining. <laughs> that is so cool. Pay close attention, everyone, because these three people now realize that there are so few of them, tomorrow they're going to negotiate for a salary increase. I'm quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. <laughs> Only three people left. Wow. So, um, are there any, uh, any CEOs in the room, any executives, any... CIOs, CTOs, CFOs, CMOs, CXOs, C, we need a bigger bloody alphabet O's. <laughs> I saw a couple of hands. I saw a couple of hands go up. All right, so here's the executive summary. Here's the executive summary for the executives and the C levels. Run experiments. That's it. You can go now. <laughs> the executives can go now. That was the executive summary. Keep running things, keep trying. Things, run experiments, that's it. Executives can go. I'm sure you're very busy calculating bonuses and firing people and all that stuff. <laughs> I know, it's a hard job. I'm a CEO as well. It's a lot of work. <laughs> oh, no, just kidding. Yeah, so running experiments, that is, that is the theme uh, that, uh, that you will need in order to be the change you wish to see, which is the title of this talk. And I'm going to give you some, uh, some examples of that, some experiments that I have been running. With my, uh, with my teams. Um, I was at uh, a conference a couple of years ago in, in Barcelona, the Agile Lean Europe Unconference, it is officially called. And there's a keynote speaker there, Jim McCarthy. Uh, and he said, you have one thing wrong in the Agile communities all over the world. You're always focusing on co-location. Put the people together in one room. He said, that is not the point. It is not the goal to have people in the same room. It is not about geographical closeness. He said, it is about mental closeness between people. And I thought, of course, I sat in the audience, and thought, of course, that's it. We have to achieve mental closeness between the people who are working on a team. And then it helps if they're in the same room, because it is easier to communicate and understand each other. It's more difficult when you're elsewhere in the world. But I have a distributed team, 15 people all over the planet. We're all over, on, on three different continents. We cannot just be, sit in the same room. So the trends are in the opposite direction. Distributed teams, remote working, flex time, you know it. So we cannot just tell people, be co-located. Uh, this is the 21st century. Grow up. So we need another thing. We need other things to achieve the mental closeness between people. So I once thought about it and I thought, what can I do to, to understand my team members a bit better, to achieve mental closeness? And I thought, well, Mind mapping is a practice that people often use to dig into a topic. What if that topic was a team member? What if that topic is me? So I started creating personal maps, mind maps about people. This is my personal map. It says Jürgen in the middle and then some things around it like family, goals and, and values, etc. And uh, you just create a mind map of yourself. And I do that with my team's uh, team as well. This is the mind map of Lizette. She's my remote office manager. And she used pictures. That is so cool. She used photos. Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and the, the idea with this practice is you're not allowed to present your personal map to the team. You just offer it, and then others have to ask questions. Because once people start presenting their personal maps, we all know what the extroverts will be doing, right? They go on and on and on and on and on about themselves. <laughs> Not allowed. So you make the map, you show it, and other people start asking questions. Like, we ask the question, hey, Lizette, why did you have pink hair here on the photo? 
oh, that was just a phase when I was 19 years old and it lasts for two years, you know, you're young. And it's so great to have a conversation like that with, uh, with people. Here's another one. This is the personal map of Hanu, and you can see that Hanu is from Finland because there's almost nothing on the personal map. <laughs> My friends in Finland pride themselves on not using too many words. <laughs> They are very terse and very, very economical with the language. They have to, because the words in Finnish are five times longer than in any other language. So, my name is Hanu. I am from Finland. All right, Hanu, that's so great. Where in Finland? <coughs> Helsinki. Cool. So, well, ultimately, we got a conversation going. That was so awesome. Hanu is a fantastic guy. He is our web developer. Uh, I have another example. This one is by Sergei, who is obviously our software architect. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> this is so nice. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with these personal maps. They just give you an insight in, 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 in the person that you're working with. I have some colorful ones by Dave from our workshops and Terry. I love it when people use markers and pencils and all that stuff. And Nicole and, uh, oh my God, Julio, engineering manager, of course. <laughs> Wonderful. I love them all. I love all these personal maps. They're very different because people are very different. And um, as I said, you, the, the, the trick is to get people to talk about each other. I now use, I, I've used these, these personal maps at the start of my workshops, and even before 9 o'clock, while people are coming in, I give them an empty paper and I tell them, draw your personal map. And the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we'll be discussing maps with each other at the table, asking questions, and then people ask questions like, oh, you're also in science fiction and fantasy, who's your favorite author? Or, oh, you studied at the same university, that's so cool, which, which year was it? people start drawing connections with each, other, with each other. That's the first step towards bonding as, as a team. It was an experiment for me that I tried, and it worked. It was successful. I have a few more experiments. Did you know that the word management is from the Italian word managiare? It means leading horses. That's so nice. <laughs> management is Leading a horse, leading a living system, right? It's not managing a machine, it is managing something that is alive. It is a very nice metaphor. In my language, manege is a place where we keep horses. Right? It is from the same root in Italian or Latin or whatever. I'm not a language expert. So, um, I like this metaphor because you can use it, you can, you can stretch it quite far. For example, sometimes at agile conferences, I've heard people say, we don't need managers. We don't need managers. We, we are self-organizing scrum teams. Let's just put the managers on the list of impediments. The scrum master will deal with them. Hmm, I don't know. I'm not so sure. I don't believe that. I, I understand the sentiment. I understand why people say it, because there's a lot of bad management in the world. I'm, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm partly responsible for that as well in the past. But no management, that a fully self-organizing team that is like a wild horse. It can do anything it wants. It is self-organizing. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not going to sit on a wild horse, slap its ass, say, yeah, and then hope and pray that it runs in the right direction. That is not the way I would like to manage my organization. Right? So we need the, the, spur, the, the bridles and the spurs and, and, and the reins and, and, and whatever. Horse riders are know far more about that than I do. And there should be a fence somewhere in the distance that says, well, you can self-organize all you want here, but behind the fence there are other horses and they have their own territory. So we need somehow to make sure that this self-organization happens within a certain domain. Well, I came up with an idea. Um, oh. <clears throat> so, um, I came up with um, uh, the idea that, that, that um, uh, delegation is more than just a binary thing. Because sometimes people say, well, it's, I, I'm, uh, things are out of control if I delegate things to others and uh, they self-organize. Uh, I, I cannot have that. Well, 
there are more shades of gray or colors between being a dictator and being an, being an anarchist. I came up with seven levels of delegation. Level one is tell. You just tell people what, what your decision is. You will do this and you will do that. Take vacation days, for example. You go on vacation in May, you go on vacation early June until the 17th. You can start your vacation from 18th of June, not further than July the 2nd. That will be dictatorship, right? You tell people. Uh, level two is sell. You try to convince people of your opinion, uh, but still you make the decision. Level three is um, uh, asking people for their input, consulting them, like, when is it that you would like to go on the vacation? Okay, you want to go in May? You wanna, okay, then I'll make the... Okay. Then these will be the vacations that you have. But I will ask people their input first. Level four is agree, is uh, 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 consensus. That would be the typical Dutch solution. We talk and talk and talk endlessly until someone dies of exhaustion. And then the winner takes the decision. So level five is the opposite of three. In this case, the team makes the decisions. They decide when they want to go on vacation, but they have to ask the manager for their suggestions first. I said, well, I would suggest that not everyone goes on vacation in the same month. That would be nice. Right? So spread it, please, a little bit. Level six is, you do what you have, whatever you want, just tell me afterwards what you've decided. And level seven is total delegation. I don't even need to know. I just, I come to the office and every day will be a surprise who was there and who was not. <laughs> that will be anarchy, right? <laughs> it can be a valid solution in some areas. So these are the seven delegation levels and you can put them in a grid. You can put them in a grid, I call them a delegation board, some people prefer empowerment board, that simply says, well, with vacation days, it says, uh, level three. You all file your requests for vacations, but the manager approves. That is a traditional position, basically. Um, and uh, level six uh, says, or tool selection, level six. Well, the teams decide which tools they use. They simply tell the manager, oh, we started using this, we started using that. It could be fine. By defining it, you make it clear to the horse where the fence is. Like, you can self-organize all you want until here. And after that, somebody else is, is responsible. Because the problem in many organizations is not, is not uh, 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 the lack of self-organization. It is that people don't know where they can self-organize. It is unclear how far they can make their own decisions. So you just have to clarify things. Here's an example of a board that was uh, sent to me uh, by, uh, by a company. You can see that the experts can see that this is a Dutch board. Why? Because we Dutch people, we love freedom, but at the same time, we don't like anarchy. Right? So we give people a lot of freedom, but there have to be a few rules. Has anyone ever flown into Schiphol Amsterdam Airport? Anyone? And you look down and you see all these fields right below. It's all very nice rectangular, all straight, straight lines. Well, most of what you see down there is probably marijuana that they're growing. <laughs> but we don't care what you grow as long as you grow it in a straight line. That's important. <laughs> yeah. So that's freedom, but not anarchy, right? So we see a bit of the same here on this board. So this company, Dutch company, has uh, seating at level one. It means you sit there, you sit there, you sit there, you not there, don't change seats, stay there, right? That is seat arrangement. Well, at the same time, salary is at level six. You pay yourself whatever you want, I don't care. Just pay yourself salary, that's fine, as long as you stay seated on that chair. You, have to, you cannot sit on another chair and then pay yourself a salary. People cannot pay themselves a salary from any chair. That will be chaos. Right? That will be Dutch. A lot of freedom, but there have to be rules. Right? It could be a perfect delegation board. I don't know. I don't know about this company. It's just that I find it very fascinating. Here's another one. This one is from Poland. They invented a new delegation level zero, which probably means I'm not even going to tell them what my decision is. <laughs> It could, be, it could be valid. I read in a, in a book, uh, Delivering Happiness, by Tony Shea. He said that when the company Zappos was acquired by Amazon, 
the management couldn't even tell employees. It was legally not allowed to discuss acquisitions with the people working for you because that could, the deal could be, could be called off in, in that case. So there are sometimes reasons for top management not to discuss something. Um, here's another one, also oh, a favorite of mine. This one is from Germany, obviously. Very complicated. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. And they adapt because they turn it 90 degrees, so now the levels are, are vertical over there. Um, and they explain, this is from a blog post, actually a very nice blog post, because they explain that the different colors, they meant different roles or different people. Like, like juniors were allowed fewer things than seniors. If you had been at the company for many years, you could do more things by yourself than someone who just arrived last month. That makes sense. They simply clarified those boundaries. So this is my own delegation board with my team. Um, lots of things on it. Uh, what about money? Can people spend money? Yes. I told my team, you can spend anything you want, up to 500 euros. Just tell me afterwards. It would be nice for me to know where the money went. That would be, that would be nice. Um, but uh, uh, more than 500 euros, um, I would like to discuss and agree on that. Right? That is like, we, I have a veto, basically, uh, a possibility there. And that makes sense, and the team is perfectly fine with it, and that helps them to self-organize. They know how to make decisions, up to where. You can play a game called Delegation Poker. You can download uh, the, uh, the cards from, uh, from the Internet and cut them yourself, or give them to your kids and have them cut them for you, or your neighbor's kids, or whatever. Um, and uh, some coaches and consultants play this game with teams and with managers to, to see what people's assumptions are, because sometimes people have very different ideas of the kinds of decisions that they can make for themselves on, on Agile Team. You just need to clarify things uh, together. So, that's another experiment that I've been running. I tried this, and I had to adapt a few things. I have to adapt the game and the board, but right now it's working pretty well. It's working quite well. But I have a few more, a few more examples. Um, there's one question that people ask me all the time, wherever I go. I have a lot of conferences and a lot of places around the world, but one question keeps coming up. A thousand questions keep coming up, actually, but there's one in particular. People ask me, Jurgen, how do I measure the performance of teams? You recognize that question? Yeah, yeah. How do I measure the performance of that Scrum or Agile team over there? Even better, how can I compare their performance with their performance? Ooh. Well, I usually answer, how do you measure your own performance? Whoa, Jurgen, what kind of question is that? Are you kidding? I'm a manager, for God's sake. <laughs> Me measuring my performance? I have a very, very complex job. I cannot just come up with two metrics that describe my performance. But I want to measure them. Well, that's not entirely fair, is it? If you don't know how to measure yourself, then how can you pretend to measure somebody else who also has a quite complex job? Probably. The answer to this question is a, a, a practice called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. It is popularized by Google. They actually borrowed or stole it from Intel, which is interesting. I was at the Intel Agile and Lean conference last year in Portland. I asked people, how many of you know about OKRs? Nobody raised their hands. I said, you don't know you've been robbed by Google. That's so interesting. <laughs> Anyways, silly anecdotes. So, OKR stands for Objectives and Key Results. I'll give you an example. It makes it very, very easy. <coughs> Simple to understand. The objective stands for something qualitative something that you want to achieve. Like, I have been trying to sell this book, I self-published it last year, this book, Workout, and obviously I wanted to sell more books. I had never published a full-color book myself before, so objective, more sales. Obvious, right? But then you have key results, that is what the KR stands for, that are basically targets that make it measurable. How many sales? Well, the idea with OKRs is you have to have more than one target, because no metric is perfect. 
you have to measure multiple things, look at it from different angles. So I came up with paper sales target, Kindle sales target, uh, EPUB sales for the first quarter of, of last year. It started paper, for example, I wanted to sell 2,500 and I was at 1,100 at the start of that, of that year. So you do your thing and after three months, because there's a cadence of three months every time, you start, you evaluate yourself. So at the end of the first quarter, I had sold 1,940 paper copies. Well, of, from 1,100 to 1,940, that's 60 percent of, of the target that I want to achieve, because I actually wanted 2,500. So, hmm, so-so. Kindle sales, worse, 36 percent. I was too optimistic, apparently. EPUB, oh my god. <laughs> Is anyone an EPUB reader here in the room? Anyone? Any EPUB readers? Are you all stealing your books from Pirate Bay, for God's sake? Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. <laughs> all right, no worries there. Oh, so apparently EPUB didn't do well. And then these percentages, you take the average, and I had an average of 33, 33%. Not so good, not so good. You know what the optimum is, what Google says? The optimum is not 100%. Because if you achieve 100% of your targets, then probably it was too easy. The sweet spot is 70%, 70-80%, they say. If you, if you achieve that, you probably did a good job. It was hard, but not too hard. 100% is also sort of a failure. Aim higher next time. Two important things. One, full transparency. Everyone at Google uses OKRs, and they can see each other's OKRs. They have a system for it. It is fascinating. Another thing is no bonuses attached. That is not allowed. There is no bonuses attached to OKRs. Imagine if a manager promised you a bonus if you achieved a certain percentage. What would happen? All the targets would go down. Because <laughs> people would make smaller targets for themselves, obviously. That is what happens with key performance indicators all over the world. We had a bit of an, a problem with my team. We experimented, we ran an experiment, and we failed with OKRs. Two things that failed for us. One, um, the cadence of every three months, that didn't work well for us. We were more flexible, more agile. We wanted quicker changes of, of uh, objectives. And the other thing, my team hates numbers. It's a bit like finance. It's important for everyone, but most people hate it. <laughs> they prefer that somebody else does the metrics. They ask me, Jurgen, can you please do the measurements for everyone? I love numbers. I even wrote a bookkeeping program. I love counting numbers, particularly when there are euro signs in front or behind it. So, um, okay, I do the numbers. So we change the practice a bit. We still have OKRs, objectives, and the key results, the targets, but I now have upper targets and, uh, and, and, and lower targets, happy and devastated, that uh, enable me to pinpoint where we are between those extremes. And then, don't be frightened, it is just a spreadsheet, okay? Ta -da. We have numbers, metrics, I calculate them, I collect them every week. Some are from, from Google Analytics, others are from MailChimp and lots of different sources. And we turn them into percentages and you can, for a spreadsheet, you can make nice colors out of that. And you take the average and then, ta-da, I can even plot an index. That is so cool. <laughs> like it's how we have our own little stock market index of our performance of our team according to the measurements that we find important for us. That is so nice. This is still an experimental phase because I run experiments all the time. We run experiments with measurements. Most important thing is I do not tell other people these are your targets. They have to tell me. What is it that you want to be measuring? What are your targets of yourself? And we add them to the spreadsheet and we run the numbers every week. So, again, another experiment I have been running. But I have a few more. I have a few more. Does anyone know from which website I stole this screenshot? Anyone? You can shout it out loud if you want. No? 
Our values are responsibility and sustainability. Volkswagen. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. They must be comedians. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, apparently something else happened at Volkswagen last year, right? They had a very different goal, actually, as a company. You know what the goal was, the purpose of Volkswagen? Does anyone know? Sorry? Sales. Sales, yes. Well, they actually had a very clear goal. There was be the biggest car manufacturer in the world. They wanted to be bigger than Toyota. That was, was communicated to everyone. They were in a race to be the biggest. Right? Not sustainability, not responsibility. It was bigger. Right? That was the goal. And, uh, well, they were bigger for a few weeks. Until, as the English say so beautifully, the shit hit the fan. I can just imagine the boardroom after the shit hit the fan. I would not want to be there. <laughs> so um, something is missing there, which is connecting what the espoused values are, what we say that we're doing versus what we're actually doing, right? Saying versus doing. There should be a feedback loop there. Agile people should know all about feedback loops, right? We have a channel. On my team, uh, we have a Slack channel called Value Stories. We discuss stories there of things that are important to us, that are ethical considerations. How do I deal with this, considering our values as, as a company? There had been a big conversation just yesterday on our Value Stories channel, because one of my team members has her own intern, and she doesn't like her work. And she says, I think I need to fire her, but I find it so difficult because she depends on this job. What, I do, what do I do? This is a typical value story. This is why we have a discussion about how to deal with this. Uh, some companies have handbooks, culture books, uh, that compare the espoused values, what people say, with what they are actually doing. Very famous one, I mentioned the name before, uh, Zappos. Uh, they have a culture book, you can download it. It looks beautiful. Lovely illustrations and photos. Uh, the Little Book of IDEO by uh, a company in, uh, famous design company in the US. Uh, they have values such as be optimistic. Well, are they really optimistic? We would need to know their story. So what's actually happening there? Uh, so you have to compare those values, what is actually happening in the, in the organization. Uh, I found an interesting practice on, uh, in the book uh, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Laloux. He said some companies have annual value days, where they simply share the stories, revisit the organization's purpose and, uh, and the ground rules, and inquire how they lived up to those purpose and values. Makes a lot of sense. Here's an interesting quote that I found last year on the, uh, on the interwebs. It went around thousands of retweets it got. The culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. Many, many retweets. If there's something happening that's bad in the organization and management does not intervene, then that will be the standard for your culture, right? That's important. But I prefer to see it from the opposite direction. I, see it, I want to see it the positive side. So I re rephrase it as the culture of any organization is best by the best behavior the leader is willing to amplify. Shine the spotlights on the good stuff that people are doing. Because if you re re uh, repeat the good things, you get more good things, basically. Sadly, this did not get thousands of retweets. I'm still working on that. Anyways, they're both examples of closing the feedback loop. What is it that people they say they are doing versus what they are actually doing? My experiments is value stories. Have stories on our Slack channel uh, and communicate about what we find important as a, as a company. Not just being bigger, but being kind, being honest, be, uh, loyalty, those kinds of things. All right, I have two more examples of, of uh, experiments that I've been running. Is anyone familiar with the practice uh, that is called the bonus system? You have that in Serbia as well, bonus system? I see some people nodding heads, one person says no, but most people say yeah. All right. So uh, it, um, it works like this. The, um, 
the, 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 the people work in the organization, do, many of them do a good job, I suppose. There's some extra money to go around, and then at the end of the year, the CEO applies what many researchers and scientists call uh, the Pareto Principle, or Zipf's Law, or the 80-20 Rule, which means that 80% disappears in the pocket of the CEO, and 20% goes to everyone else. So kind, so kind of top management to distribute the other 20% across everyone. And the question is, who gets how much? Who gets how much? Well, traditionally, the managers decide, right? The managers decide, you get this, you get that, you get that, based on performance criteria that they make up or something like that. And then usually at the end of the year, everyone gets or, some money. Well, you know one thing for sure. Everyone is going to hate the manager for doing a bad job distributing that bonus money. It turns out, usually, always, in many organizations, people are unhappy with the bonus system. I was once, many years ago, working uh, in a company where, at the end of the year, some people got a bonus of 20 euros. It's better to pay people nothing than 20 euro bonus. <laughs> because the profits were not that big that year, and, well, the calculations simply turned out that way. Bad, 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 bad. So some people say, let's get rid of that practice. No bonus systems. It is best to just pay everyone a steady salary throughout the year. No silly bonuses. Okay, I understand, but I don't think it works. Because, you know, Many researchers confirm again and again that people overestimate their own contributions to a social system. 70% of drivers think they are above average drivers. 80% of college professors think they are above average college professors. Makes no sense. They are smart people. They should understand the concept of average and 50%. Right? I'm very sure that among professional keynote speakers, 90% think they are above average. Silly. I read the research on Science Daily just a few weeks ago. They actually measured it. They asked people on teams, how much, in terms of a percentage, have you contributed to the results of this team? They added the percentages. Guess how much they ended up with? 140. 140%. And the percentage got bigger, the bigger the team was. So the larger the team, the more people overestimate their own contribution. So if you pay everyone a steady salary, you just will be demotivating a large portion of the company, because many people will think they are underpaid. And it will be demotivating them. It won't be true, but you have no data to prove it, to put them back with their feet on the ground, back in reality. I prefer something else that I call merit money, or peer-to-peer -peer crediting. It works as follows. Me, as a CEO, I still decide how much bonus money there is, but I do not decide who gets how much. That decision I distribute to the crowd, and I let the games begin. <laughs> it is so cool. So, for example, we use a tool called Bonusly, bonus.ly. It allows us to credit each other for our contributions. Um, for example, Jennifer got five points from Sergey for keeping in mind what our, our initial intention was. Andy got 10 points from Patrick for automating the onboarding workflow. Pilar got 10 points from Andy for being clear. I don't like these strategic discussions. He appreciated that. We can give each other points any day of the month, any amount, up to 100. We start with 100, we have to get rid of those points before the end of the month, because at the end of the month, whew, they're gone. Right? And we start again with 100. So we are expected to credit each other. There's one important thing, we cannot credit ourselves. It is only peer-to-peer -peer crediting. So the points that we get from other people, they accumulate. Every month, we have more points in our back pocket. And then we wait for the bonus money. Now the question is, how do we convert those points to bonus? This is how we do that. I don't hear sounds. I don't hear sounds. It was working before we started. Yes, okay. thank you. Dice. Oh, come on, big money. Big money. Everyone, give it a kiss. <laughs> <laughs>
Come on, come on, lucky dice. We love you, we love you. Oh, it's a six! It's a six! No Yay! Yay. <laughs> Can you see? Can you see yeah. that? So the rule is, at the first meeting of the month, someone on the team throws the dice. If they throw a six, there is a bonus. No six, no bonus. <laughs> Easy. Easy. And it's like a jackpot. Every month I set aside some bonus money, and it's, it just keeps growing. It keeps growing until someone throws a six. No six, it just moves to the next month. So it's completely unpredictable when you get the bonus money. The money is there, you just don't get it. <laughs> you have to throw a six. So the funny thing is, Louise, who threw the six, uh, she is the one who always throws the dice, because the team says that she has the lucky hand. So cool. And she has, because she threw a six three times in 11 months. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> we are considering renting her out <laughs> to casinos. <laughs> so uh, some people ask me, but Jurgen, doesn't this become a popularity contest? People crediting each other with points, etc. I say, well, uh, could be, I don't know but you already have a popularity contest with the traditional system. It is called kissing the boss's ass. <laughs> that is the popularity contest you already have. The person who is best able at kissing the boss's ass gets the most bonus money. On our team, we have democratized ass kissing. <laughs> we have to kiss a lot of asses to get a bit of bonus money, I can tell you that. It was Jennifer's ass yesterday, today is Sergei's ass, tomorrow is Louise's ass, he has asses everywhere, all day long. Yes, yes, that's what it means to be a, a team member who is valued and appreciated by others. You have to do things, work for the team, in order to collect a decent amount of bonus money. The team loves it, by the way. There was only one person who didn't like the, the bonus system, and we fired her. So. That was another experiment, and the experiment was running well. Final example. Another example. I was, uh, I was once uh, having a, a meeting with my CEO, a lunch meeting, and I said, we never celebrate anything. We should celebrate something every now and then. He said, okay, what do you suggest? I said, well, maybe something that makes a lot of noise. We had a big open office space. I said, okay. Two weeks later, he came with this ship's bell. This is the actual photo, actual bell. Big ship's bell. He said, here's the bell, use it. Okay, cool, big ship's bell. So I brought the bell to the office police, the office manager, I'm sorry. <laughs> and she put the bell in the middle of the office near the coffee machine, and anyone was allowed to ring the bell for, to celebrate something. A big new customer, a, a, a new website deployed, a baby delivered, well, by an employee, not by the company, of course. Anything was allowed, we could ring the bell. The last time that I heard the bell was when the CEO announced to everyone that I had just quit my job. That's oh, serious, that's really. So, um, and then of course everyone would gather around a coffee machine and then there would be cookies and cake, etc. Now the question is, when do you ring the bell? Do you celebrate success or do you celebrate failure? Some people say, well, you celebrate failure. It's okay to celebrate failure. I hear that often at Agile conferences. There are even conferences about failure. Failure conferences. Yeah. Say, yeah, celebrate failure. Other people say, yeah, celebrate success. Other people say, let's celebrate success and failure. Party all the time, doesn't matter. <laughs> so, here's the answer to that dilemma. There are things that we call good practices. We usually have good practices because they lead to successes, usually, but not always. Like, uh, sometimes good practices fail. I had a silly, silly thing. I had an email from Poland just a few weeks ago. Someone said, Jurgen, we tried the bell, didn't work. How is that possible? Well, they said, um, we, we rang the bell a few times and everything was fine until uh, one of the software developers uh, rang the bell to celebrate that he had had great sex the night before. <laughs> After that, nobody wanted to ring the bell anymore. 
Nobody could top it with even better sex, apparently. <laughs> so the practice didn't work anymore at that company. It happens. Mistakes are things that usually lead to failure, but sometimes mistakes lead to successes. You're being a bloody idiot, and you get away with it. <laughs> That's possible. That's possible. In the middle, we find experiments. We try experiments because they lead to learning. Learning is optimal here in the middle of that, of that diagram. We don't learn when we repeat good practices. We don't learn when we repeat uh, mistakes. We learn when good practices fail. Ah, interesting. So the bell does not work for that company in Poland. Interesting. Uh, we learn when mistakes succeed, but uh, celebrate failure would mean this entire red part of the diagram. Don't celebrate that. Why would you celebrate these uh, failures that are a result of mistakes? No reason at all to celebrate that. It makes sense to celebrate success, but you should not, be the, you should not do that as, as the only thing. You should celebrate uh, uh, learning as well, which is in the middle the result of experiments. By the way, networks are great at running experiments. Hierarchies are great at repeating good practices. Hierarchies are also good at repeating the same mistakes again and again, by the way. And we need a bit of both, networks and, uh, and hierarchies. Uh, so, um, by all means, celebrate success, but you also have to celebrate experiments. And that is, again, we come back to the, the topic that I have been talking about for 45 minutes. So run experiments all the time. I call this celebration grid. People use it in retrospectives to emphasize that we have to keep running experiments, keep pouring new ideas in, into, this, uh, into this middle, uh, middle column. So, that's it. Those are the experiments that I have been running. I have asked at the start, who is a happy worker, able to introduce change and help the companies innovate? Well, by doing a lot of these things, running all kinds of experiments. And uh, I have been managing for 20 years, and last year one of my team members told me, Jürgen, you are my first manager who doesn't suck. Well, that was such a kind compliment, I think. <laughs> it took me 20 years not to suck anymore. <laughs> I hope you learn faster than I did. All right? Have fun in this conference, and then we can talk more in the afternoon during the discussion. Thank you so much. And here we have once again Mr. Jurgen Apelo. Now I'll start the picture of Srpskom.